Okay, so we got this vector from P to Q. We do final minus initial. And then now we want the velocity to be in that direction with magnitude 5. So what do we do again? So this would be, what do we say? Velocity is kind of like R prime. Is that, is that 38 is the magnitude? Square root of 38? Yeah. So then we're going to take, so uh, say 1 over square root of 38 times. And what is that? That's a unit vector in the same direction as 2, 5, 3. So it has magnitude 1. So then we multiply that by 5. And now we've got a vector of magnitude 5 in that same direction. So we could write it this way. So we could say, what, 10? What about 25? So here's another. So writing it in x, y, and z component. Oh, that's k. OK, does that first part make sense? All right, find the parametric equations for the particle's motion. So parametric equations can come from the vector function. So if you if this is this is constant velocity in the x direction, constant velocity in the y direction, constant velocity in the in the z direction, so then what will What will our position function be, our original vector function? What original function would give us, what, a derivative of these constants? So what is that? It's antiderivative, right? So what would what is the antiderivative of a constant? Times t, right? But there's just one more thing we've got to... Do you remember also what you need? Yeah. So we could say plus say uh, c i, so some constant for the i direction. We'll figure out what that is in a second. Plus 25 So why are we doing this? Why? Because the now the derivative of this, we know to get from our position to our velocity, it's derivative, right? Rate of change. So you take you take the derivative of that to get that. So it's just kind of a Basic antiderivative. So this would be c in the j direction. Okay, so you can, I, that's going to be self explanatory, it'd be the same. Now the question is what's this constant? So what do we want? We want it so that it says it starts at point th uh, 3, 2, negative 5. So that means at t equals 0, what do we want? At t equals 0. We want the x coordinate to be 3. So, what do we make this constant so that when you plug in t equals 0, you get 3? So, it's going to be 3. You see that? So, now at t equals 0, the, the x, x coordinate will be 3. And that's what we want. And the derivative will be this constant. This. The derivative of this is this for the velocity. And at t equals 0, it makes 3. So then this one will be? What, 2? And you can do the, the this you can finish yourself. OK, does that make sense? Well, it's, in this question, it said the particle starts at point P. So they'd have to give you some information about what's going on at a particular time in order to solve for those constants. And so they're, what they're telling you is that time equals zero, it's point P. So it's not, it's not always going to be the same. It's just you have to give the information of the problem. If you plug in the point from Q, it doesn't be wrong. Right, because then it's, if it starts at point P and then later it's at point Q, then it's not, it's not at point Q at T equals zero. So what we want is that... We want r of 0 to be what? We want r of 0 to be, meaning at time 0, what vector do we want to get? 
3, 2, negative 5, because we want it to be at point P at time 0. It says it starts at point P. So you don't want to put 5, 7, negative 2. So yes, when we were talking about like the equation of a line, there was no like time involved. Any point would do to generate the points in the line. But now, a particular t value means a particular point, so you can't just plug anything you want in. I think that's what you're getting at, right? Yeah. yeah. OK, questions on 26? Okay, next one I think was uh, 28. Let's look at 28. Okay, so when and where. So this is, so basically you have a line and a plane. And so uh, 28A would be similar to problems we've had before. Um, now they're just talking about a particle. But it's basically where does that line intersect that plane? And then the t value will be the time, and then the x, y, and z will be the location. Can I erase this stuff for 26? So 28. So how do we figure out, remember we've done this uh, recently, how do you figure out if x is 1 plus t? Yeah, I think we saw this last class, didn't we? We did an example of this last class. 5 plus 2t. Negative 7 plus t. And what's the plane? x plus y plus equals 1. So we basically want the intersection of these two. So we're going to combine these two equations. We want both of these things to be true. We want the x to be the and y and z to be these. And we want this relationship to be true. So what can we do? Yeah, so you can do it. So then it's 1 plus t plus. 5 plus 2t minus, minus 7 plus t equals 1. So that gives what? 4t equals 2? I think it's all 2, right? Yeah. The 1s go away. This is negative 2, positive 2 over here. So t is? So that would be the time. So you're talking about seconds? Yeah, yeah seconds. So at time equals one half seconds is when you have the intersection, and then how do we find the point? Plug it back in. Plug it into yeah. You're gonna plug it into your x, y, and z. So that it would be a three halves, six, negative six point five, negative thirteen halves. Okay, does everyone follow that? And is it different if that's in like parentheses or parentheses or whatever that's called? What's that? Would that be in parentheses or is that? Like so one? point. This is so. This is a point. You know, location of a point. Location okay. is is a coordinates. Okay. But so what's kind of confusing is whenever we were equations of lines, like vector functions, they're vectors. But then those vectors are in standard position. So as vectors, the coordinates of the tip as a vector is the same as. Yeah. The point in space. So sometimes you can do either. If you if you're in the context of a vector function, then writing a, as a vector, implying that it's in standard position, is the same thing. Uh, okay, B. So now we want to know how fast how fast is it going when it hits the plane. So when does it hit the plane? And what tells us how fast? What tells us how fast? Here is this is our Vector function, it's just in par parameterized form, but it's just a vector function. This is like R of t, if you want to rewrite it. And how do we get how fast? R prime. We want R prime, specifically. Plug in t. Okay, so our, the R prime function is? Uh, one. Two, one. So then what's R prime of one half? What's our prime of 10? What's our prime of 0? What kind of speed is this? Constant. Constant speed. It does, right? So there's no t's in our function for speed. So no matter what time it is, it's the same, it's the same constant speed. So it's going 1 in the x direction, 2 in the y, 1 in the z, always. It's a constant, constant speed. And so how fast? How we, so what is this how fast? This is, how, this is how fast in each direction separately, but the overall how fast is? Speed function is our magnitude, right? 
Is it six? Square root of six. Is the is the overall how fast? The one, two, one is like how fast in each separate direction, right? So in the x direction, speed of one, y direction, speed of two, direction, speed of one. Okay, 29B, I think, was requested. Is that right, Cutter? Yeah. At what time does the stone hit the ground? Okay, so looking at uh, any more questions about 28. Please. So where are you getting the r prime of t plus 1, 2, 1 from? Um, so that's the, this is this is like the position function. And you can think of it like as rt. We could rewrite that as 1 plus t, 5 plus 2t as a vector function. So what is then the velocity function? It's the derivative of that. You see it now? Yeah, that's how that's how we get r prime of t. Um, you take the derivative of each individual component. Remember, I had you do that before I even last class before I even showed you, right? I said, find the derivative or find the rate of change function. And you're able to do it before I even told you because it's just like falling out of bed, right? You just do the derivative on each one individually. <clears throat> okay, any other questions on this one? Okay, 28b. So you want to know when it hits the ground. So what is the vector function we got here? So what is this function telling us? What is tell me what does this function tell us? Position. Position of this what falling object? Yeah. At any time t, right? So I so I'm gonna plug in. Say if I want to know what the what its position is at one, what do I do? I get ten minus five. And is that one point five? Yeah. I get four point nine, six point four I think that's one point five, right? So for any given time, you can plug it in. It'll tell you the position of this object, right? <clears throat> That's the idea of a function. Time varies, and as time varies, the position varies. And this, this formula is tell us what the position is at any given time. So what, if we want to know when it hits the ground, then what do we want to know, Cutter? What? When what is zero, though? When z is zero. Right. So when it hits the ground is going to be when z is zero. So we're going to take 6.4. Minus 4.9 t squared. Okay. And solve for, zero, solve for t. I said the whole thing goes Yes, you're going to have a different value of t that's going to make each. So zero will make these two zero. Uh -huh. And then different values. T makes these zero. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, hitting the ground is only about the z component. And then I think the last one is the additional problem number four. Yep. Any questions on that? That one. Okay, additional problem four. Let's go back to assignments here. This one. Okay, so this was a little bit of a review. This is, uh, we, and that's good to review. So we want to find, so the shadow of the cylinder is just um, projection, right? So what will x squared plus z squared equal 6? So first of all, what is that? What is that? Can we sketch or imagine that circular cylinder before we get started here? So how, how do you sketch or imagine that? Cylinder, what do you mean on the y-axis? Like centered on the y-axis, okay. And what is the radius? Square root square to six. So, so to draw, this is kind of a harder circle to draw, but at the top you want it to go parallel to your x-axis, at the bottom also parallel, and then front and back it's going to be straight up and down, so this is kind of a way to start like this. Oh, 
not my best, but you get the idea. Okay, so, but you're imagining that. What's that's perpendicular to the screen, right? That's coming in and out of the screen, perpendicular as a circle. And then, it, is that what it is? Is it a circle? Cylinder. cylinder. So how do I make it into a cylinder now? Yeah, it extends parallel to the y-axis. Like the y is like the central axis of it. Let me do this again here. That's better. Go faster, it's a little better, but my pen doesn't, my pen is out of ink over here. Okay, can't draw over there. All right, so what do we want? What's the shadow of this, or what's the, we talked about projections, that's all this is saying. The shadow is like the projection. What's the projection of this in the XC plane? Meaning, if you just looked in the XC plane, what would you see? That circle, right? If you were looking this way, you would just see that circle in the XC plane. You wouldn't see it as a surface. You would just be looking straight down. You just see the circle. Okay, so we want to parameterize that, right? Vector function for that. So the shadow, what do we know right away? Y is zero. If it's in the XC plane, Y is zero. And then we need to parameterize or make a vector function out of the circle. Remember how to do that? Square root of six. Cosine t. Square root of 6 sine t. That's cosine and sine. All right. So now we want the intersection with that and this. Okay. So how can we start then? So what about the XZ projection of this um, intersection of these two things? So I'm going to cut through this with a plane, and that's going to make a, a, a curve, like a ellipse, a slant of the ellipse. And how will that project into the XZ plane? So you get some, I don't know, you're going to get some slanted, what is Z? Z is 1 7th. I don't know. So it's gonna, it's gonna, it's gonna do something. Okay, it's gonna make some cylinder like some. That was really awful. Try that again. Much better. Okay. So when you when you cut through a plane, you're gonna get some like slanted like ellipse in space. But when you project that to the XZ plane, what's it gonna be? Circle. Same circle again, right? Because it's all points on your cylinder. Since it's all points on your cylinder, looking down the y-axis of the xz plane is going to give the same thing. So how can we start? Same thing for the for x and z. We can do the same thing. So you get radical six, cosine t, and so we still can do that because the projection into the xz plane is still that same circle. And how are you going to get the y? What does y equal? No, what does y equal? No. This is how we're going to get y. One. Minus. And then? Over two. And what's x? Uh, like the square root of six. And z? So we did those either the beginning of class last time or last Thursday, I don't remember. Was that last Thursday? Yeah. Where we were parameterizing and then finding the third variable using the other equation. So then once those are plugged in there, then that will go there. And that'll be your parameterization of that. Should we put it in and see what it looks like? No, that's not what I meant. Okay, so what is our function? I'm not equals uh, 
square root of 6 times cosine t I knew it was going to do that I got it there I'm just going to make a paste here sine and then what's this Zero? No, we want, let's get the actual orange, the actual curve of intersection of the two. So we'll do what? One minus that times three. Then? Minus seven times, times, what's the cosine now? Sine. Sine, I mean. All over two. Here we go. Right. I'm gonna have to. It's only gonna be part of it. I gotta do t here. Say from zero to two pi. Okay, so that is the intersection of, that's the intersection of that circular cylinder that I drew in black and a, and a plane. So what happens, what's going to happen if I look at, right down the y-axis at the xz plane? I'm going to see the circle with radius. Square root of 6. Let's see it. There's a keyboard shortcut. I just don't remember what it is. What am I doing wrong here? Why is that? It's turning into a plane, not a circle. It should look like a circle. Oh, here we go. I wasn't, yeah, I didn't go far enough. There we go. Here it comes. Is that it? Pretty close? There it is. <laughs> So that's looking right down the x, y axis, the xz plane. That's showing us the circle. Radical 6 cosine, radical 6 sine. But then you see it's some, in some other view, this is the plane. So when you look straight, that's looking straight parallel to the plane, whatever. That's not down, right down an axis, though. But So I can, what was the plane again? Equals? There it is. So there's the plane that that lives in. Okay. But that plane, of course, that plane extends in all directions, right? So I zoom out. There we go. Go bigger. So that's the plane that the it lies in, and we and you look down the xz, look down the y-axis of the xz plane, you see the circle that it also lies on the cylinder. Okay. Other questions on the homework. Is there one? Oh, sorry. In the worksheet. So how do we get the speed? So we need, if we want the minimum speed, then we need a speed function. Did you come up with a speed function? So this is this is our position. How do we get a speed function? Remember what we talked about last time? What did you say? Oh, sorry. I heard you say second derivative. Is that what you said? First derivative. Good. Right. Exactly. So that's position. Velocity will be negative 8t 
negative two, negative three. Do I have that right? Check my math. And now that's the velocity function, right? Our prime. And now we want the speed function, you said. Right, so that's going to be our speed function, which would be square root of 64t squared, 13. And so now, remember from Calc 1, how do you minimize a function? How can we find the minimum? So now that's our speed function. We're trying to figure out when is that the lowest. You set that equal to 0? Well, if you set that equal to zero, then that's saying that's when the speed is zero. So, I guess in, in a way that's true. Yeah. That's right. So, if you want a function to be minimized, you take the derivative of that function and set it to equal to zero. Remember that from Calc 1? So, why is that true? Because if you have a function like this, and we care about what lo what happens at a local max and a, lo a local min. What happens? Is Slope is zero, right? It's, it evens out. So if you take the derivative function and set it equal to zero, then you're isolating these places where it levels out. And those are local max and min. <coughs> so derivative is? One half, this is chain rule, right? So derivative of square root is one over two times that square root, right? Plus 13, and then times by the chain rule, remember? Derivative of the interior, so what's that? 128 t. So that is the derivative of the speed function. And when is that equal to zero? So only we care only about the numerator now, right? Only the numerator do we care about. The denominator can't make a fraction zero. So t is zero. So t equals zero is going to result in the minimum speed. Is when, and what is the minimum speed? Square root of thirteen. So you can see that this is just an always this is a square root function with t squared is always going to increase, right? So as t increases, that function will always get bigger and bigger and bigger. So the minimum has to be when at the starting point <coughs> equals zero, and that that confirms that it's true. So did you cut? Did you catch all that? Yeah. 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 So you got your speed function, and then you got to use a calc one idea of to minimize a function. You take this derivative and set equal to zero. Yeah. Sure. <coughs> Okay, so we'll move on here. Oh, what's up? Maybe. Sometimes technology is, is, is helpful. Every once in a while. Okay, sorry. Oh, it's not, right? I just was listening to you guys. I was just writing out what you guys said. What's that? Yeah, it'd be 2t minus 3. Yes, absolutely. I was just listening to you. This should be 2t minus 3. And that makes this a lot different. So then you're going to have 64t squared plus 4 plus this thing squared. So then you'll have something more complicated in the top here. So you'll have a more complicated expression here that has a more complicated chain rule interior. And that'll be more interesting than just t equals 0. So now it won't be t equals 0 anymore. So can you finish it from there? Does that make sense? So this won't be, this will be now what? 64t squared plus 4 plus 2t minus 3 squared. But then the rest of the process is the same. 
So you can multiply this out and simplify. Yeah, you don't have to moan and groan because we won't do it. But just um, so you multiply this out and simplify, and then you take the derivative, set it equal to zero, and then now this will be something like a, it'll be another a polynomial that you'll have to solve for zero. Okay, thank you for pointing that out. So this is not right. Okay, clear your desk. All right, so what what grade do you want on the quiz out of 20 today? 25 extra. One. Don't push your luck. What grade do you want out of 20? 20. Okay, it's 20. Everyone gets 20 on the quiz today. <laughs> Unless you want to take a quiz. <laughs> Sensing some disappointment in the, in the room. I want to make sure. Yeah, David. I was going to give number 10. Oh, you want to give number 10 if you want to do it on your Exactly. Yeah, no, let's um, let's do it outside of class time now. If you want to do it like for Tuesday or something like that, I think we'll do like Tuesday office hours or something like that. Rather than take the time to yeah. Which number? Number uh, from the from whatever the section was. Okay. Yeah, from the section of the book. So that's what I was going to say. Which is basically this again. Right? Number 10 was just this. Just um, finding the velocity function and the speed function. That's what I was going to sign for the quiz. Okay. So... Then here is the exact same thing again. So, so if so, here's practice that was going to be like the quiz. All right. So here's good practice. So I want you to identify and find four functions. Right, the position function. In fact. Uh, so I'm gonna I'll give you the green curve in a second, but so position function. <laughs> velocity. Um, unit tangent function. And speed function. So this is this is just like just like what I was going to give you for the quiz, and I'll give you the, the the green curve here. The green curve is so. First of all, identify identify those from the picture, and I'm asking you for four. So one of those is not pictured, right? So three of those are in the picture: blue, red, and black. So I want you to write the. Uh, Identify and write the position function, the velocity function, the unit tangent function, and the speed function. So here's this good practice, and it'd be just like the quiz I was going to give. Position function is. So first of all, is it one of these three? Oh. And which one? Green. Uh, so the green is the curve. Yeah, that's true. But so which is it? One of these vectors that's uh, blue. blue. Okay, so the blue. <laughs> And so we'll do R of T, that's the blue one. Okay, what is it, Brandon? Okay. So the curve, the curve, the, the 
parameterization of the curve is the same as the vector function for the position. Are we good? That's the and that was the blue one. Okay, Raj, how about the velocity function? Is that represented by one of these three here? What's that? The red. He wants the velocity is the red function. Caden, you agree with that? Helena, you agree with that? The red one is velocity. Are you changing your mind? He wants black. Okay, how about you guys over here? Did you think it was the black or the red velocity? The velocity. Black or red? It is black. It's the black one. And how do we symbolize that? Our prime, right? Our prime. Rate of change. Okay? Tell me what the velocity function is. Tyler, did you get it? Everybody agree? Yes. Unit tangent function. Ryan, did you get that? First of all, is that is that one of these three? The unit tangent function? Yes. So what direction does the unit tangent function point in? Same as a velocity, right? Unit tangent. Tangent is like direction you're going, right? So that would be velocity. So is it the red one or not? Yeah, it is. It is. And what's our symbol for that? T. And how do we get it from velocity and or position? Position over speed. David, you agree with that? So with the unit tangent function, which always points in the same direction as the black vector, right? Hold on a sec. So I'm gonna write, how do I get this function? If it's what? It's the unit tangent function. Okay, hold on a sec, hold on a sec. Good, good. So it's the unitized version of that. Is that what you're gonna say, Tyler? Yeah, so we're going to take 1 over the square root of 1 plus 4 cosine squared t plus sine squared t times 1, 2 cosine t, sine t. Ran out of room. Okay, speed function. Jake, what's the speed function? Is that one of these three that's being shown? Uh, no. Okay. It is the square root of, well, whatever you have under the factor. Whatever, this one right here? Yes. And how do I, how do I kind of denote that or represent it? Um, so you just think? The absolute value of it or the magnitude. Magnitude, good. Of the velocity. Good. And if we want, we can do like uh, this. So V is for velocity, but this is ju it's just a scalar function, scalar velocity or speed. So if you do like lowercase v, that means speed only, not direction. No vector, right? No vector. Okay, and it'll be one plus. Okay, and then uh, who is it that wanted to, was it Max, was that you? Wanted to simplify it? So you actually can use that and you make it into two terms instead of three. So notice you could pick off one cosine squared and leave three left. And then the one cosine squared plus sine squared would be one plus the one is two plus how many cosine squares were left? So you could do that if you want. Not totally optional, but it makes two, ter two terms under the radical instead of three, so. That would be the same. Okay, so now I want you to bring together these three 
functions right here. So the r prime of t, can you write a statement that brings together r prime of t, t of t, and v of t? You can write a statement that brings those three together. Can you do it? Can you write a, a mathematical statement that brings those three functions together in one, one statement? Can you write a statement that brings those three, those three functions together in one statement? For instance, v of t equals r prime of t plus t of t. That's totally wrong, but that's an example of the kind of thing I'm talking about. v of t equals r prime of t plus capital T of t. Totally wrong, but it's an example. David thinks he's got it. Who else thinks they got it? Lucas, Brandon, Giorgio, the rest of you. What do you think? Chandler's got it. So here's the hint. What is capital T relative to R prime of T? What is that? What does capital T tell us about that function? Direction. Just direction, right? And what does this tell us about that function? Speed. Magnitude, right? So here, you, R prime of T is made up of direction and speed. So how would you put them together to get R prime? Who's dying to who? Lucas, what were you going to say? Oh, no. Say it. So, the T of R prime of T. Sorry. R prime of T. R prime of T. Equals. Equals. T of T. T of T. Times loss. Times V of T. So the rest of you were thinking who raised their hands? That's it, because if you take the magnitude of it times the direction, you get the vector itself, right? It's got both together, so those, that's how those three are related. Okay, any questions? So this is similar to what I was going to do for number 10 for the quiz, for, and if you still want to do number 10, you can still do number 10. Any questions on that? Okay, so at the end of class last time, we talked about two more vectors besides the unit tangent. Do you remember that? Let's review that. Okay, so here those are. So can you review? So what, what were the three vectors? We had the unit tangent, unit normal, unit binormal. So which is which? Which is which? So unit tangent is review. We just talked about that. Which one was that? Red. Red. Remember what unit normal was? What it, what it meant? So what it did? Direction of turning, right? So it's like you're in the car. If, if you're in the car and you're turning right, it points straight out the passenger side window. That's the direction of N. And if you're turning left, then straight out the driver's side window. So which one would that be? That's the black one, right? It points to like the center of rotation of your turning. It points right to the center of rotation of your turning. Okay, and that leaves the last one, which was the binormal, okay? So these, uh, these vectors, the one thing that, did I show you the planes last time? At the end? Yes. So, so I'm, let's find, can you find the equation of the normal plane? Can you find the equation of the normal plane? What does that mean? That's the plane that cuts normal to the curve. This is at pi over 2. Here we are. This is this point right here is um, t equals pi over two. So I want to write the equation of the normal plane. So let's look at. Let's first imagine it.
So how would that normal plane, so normal means orthogonal to the curve. So what two vectors would make up or be parallel to that plane? Which two vectors would make, okay, he's saying red and black is normal to the curve. Agree with that? Normal. Normal means orthogonal, right? So I want, through this point, I want the plane that's orthogonal to the curve. Which two vectors would be parallel or make up that plane? So let me, can you imagine that plane first of all? Let's see, it's uh, this one. Yep, right here. That's the orthogonal or normal plane to the curve, right? That's plane, the plane curve comes through and, and cuts through exactly perpendicular. So, which two vectors are parallel to that plane? Binormal and unit normal. Which vector then would help us write the equation of that plane? It's a red one. What's that for you? Tangent. So if you want to write the equation of the normal plane, you're going to use the orthogonal vector, which is tangent. The tangent vector is orthogonal to the normal plane, as you can see in that picture. So you can do it. So you can write the equation of the normal plane. Go. Oh, yes, sir. It's the same one as before. Same position. So we got to get the equation of the normal or orthogonal plane. Let me give you something that might help. <laughs> you can you can use the red unit tangent vector, but you can use any vector in that direction. So what's another vector that might be easier in that direction? Position vector? The oscillation vector? That's the position vector? No. This is the position vector. Yeah. Yeah, just you don't have to you don't have to make it a unit vector. You don't you can don't have to worry about the square root, right? So it'll make life it'll make life easier. So you can use the square root, but it'll make it a lot easier if you just don't and just use where did that unit tangent vector come from? It came from what is it the direction of? If the blue one is R, then the direction of the red one is? R prime, right? R prime, velocity. Yeah. So that will save you the square root part of it. Oh, yeah. And where did you plug in that? Why would you do it? Did you plug that in for position? Plug it in for velocity. Everything. You need, so you need it for everything. Every time just keep plugging it. But to find, to find the point. What's that? We're trying to find the point of the unit point. Yeah, where do the points come from on the curve? Yes, sir. What's our generic equation of a plane? No, press the line. Plane. What's our equation of a plane? Philip. Do you remember what Philip? You remember what the generic equation of a plane was? What? <laughs> you gotta remember this. So lines and planes. You gotta remember. Ryan wants to tell me. He's dying. Ax plus by plus cz. Okay, but if we're, so yes, that's true, but if we're writing the equation of plane, what was the equation we used when we were writing an equation of a new plane? A times. Remember this? Equals C 
So what do we need? What's our A, B, and C? What is that going to be? Represent? And how does it relate to the plane, that vector? Orthogonal vector, A, B, C. And then X naught, Y naught, Z naught? What is it? What is it in general? X naught, Y naught, Z naught? Point on the plane, right? So we got our orthogonal vector, A, B, C, and the point on the plane. X naught, Y naught, Z naught. So how do we get? Let's do the orthogonal vector first. So yeah, we can use R prime. We said it was one. Is that what we're going to plug into our plane equation? Yeah. That's this is a vector function. This tells us every velocity vector for every normal plane. So we want to know this particular vector right here. How do we get this particular vector? You plug in. You're going to plug in pi over 2. That will give us this particular vector, which is? 1, 1, 0, 1. Let's make sure that makes sense, right? So does it look like it has an x component and a z component, but no y component? Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. It's, par it's parallel to the xz plane. Do you see that? So it goes out in x, and it goes up the same amount in z, but it doesn't go in and out of the screen y. Question? Oh, no, I have the question. Cool. Um, so what about the point? How did you get the point, Lucas? The point is you just plug in your uh, t to your position vector. Right. Tyler, question? Okay, so did you do you see that we need this black vector that I drew right here? What is that? That's like that's the direct um, that comes from the rate of change function. That's like the uh, the velocity function. But it's at we want this particular plane when so this is a corresponds to the to the t value of pi over two. If I change pi, so I change that, you know, if I change the pi over two value, then everything's different. Now I have a different unit tangent, a different normal, right? And I wanted, but I wanted this particular plane, this one here. All of these are functions. They're all functions, meaning if you change that input t, you get different. So that's like I was showing you like this. This is showing you function, right? As, as little t changes, your position changes, your velocity changes, the unit normal changes, the, it all changes, the whole thing changes, right? So now I'm isolating a particular situation and asking for that particular plane. So that means a particular value of little t. Is it better? Yeah, I mean, that's like a super important question because it's like getting at the heart of what a function is. A function, it gives us a values of some quantity as another quantity changes. So what is the point we're gonna plug in? It's like where Lucas was take, doing it here. So what was that, Lucas? It's one, two, zero. So one, two, zero is... Oh, sorry. Uh, this was our prime, right? Say it again. One more time. Pi halves. Two. Two. Zero. So the position function gives us that point, the location. The velocity function gives us what? The tangent vector. Not unit tangent, but actual tangent. And now we can write the equation. So who wants to tell me? Somebody new. Somebody new for the equation. Sebastian, did you get the equation? Can you do it on the fly? So what is the value of A? A, B, C is our vector, 
That's an orthogonal vector, right? And we found that was what? Right, so it'll be 1. X plus zero. Okay. Equals. And if we wanted to change this around, we could make it into like Z equals something or. X plus Z equals so that defines the gray plane all the points on the gray plane awesome so the visualization is really important here right not just like where did I put what numbers but okay we know that the if I want the normal plane, I need the tangent vector. And the tangent vector is from the derivative, right? Because that's the velocity. It's the direction the curve is going. And so that's going to be my ABC for the plane. And then to get my point on the plane, it's going to be the point of yeah, normalcy, like, or whatever that is. Point where the, where the plane cuts through. And that just comes from the position, right? So that's pi over 2 in the position plane. Questions? Like that. Before I erase, last chance, last chance. Okay, so what about what I want? Yeah. So there's only a triangle of it, but what plane would this be? How would you describe that plane relative to the curve? How is that plane intersecting the curve? I can imagine it extending further out than just the triangle that's shown. The tangent, right? Isn't that plane tangent to the curve? Yep, this is called the tangent plane. What two vectors are parallel? Which of the two vectors are parallel to that plane? Red and the pink, good. Red and the pink. Red is? Tangent. Pink is? Binormal. Therefore, to write the equation of this plane, I need the normal vector is orthogonal to the tangent plane. Do you see that? So if you're going to write the equation of the tangent plane, you don't use the tangent vector. It's parallel to it. You use the normal vector. So now we can just eyeball what that normal vector is because of symmetry here. Do you see exactly? Look at what the, you can just write down the normal vector. It's a unit vector, and it's in what direction? Really close? Negative, negative. It's a unit vector strictly in the negative y direction. So you can write down that normal vector here at pi over 2 rather than doing all the awful algebra to find it. Just write it down. And then write the equation of the tangent plane. Write the equation of the tangent plane. This question. That's the normal plane. It cuts or it's orthogonal to the curve. This is the tangent plane. It's tangent to the curve. That's right. Scylla t equals pi over two. So this should go a lot faster, right? So what is the orthogonal vector? That's the normal vector, which you can just we can just eyeball and write it down. Okay, <laughs> Philip, I let you off the hook last time, not this time. Did you get it? All right, tell me. Okay, so. 
solution. So you think the uh, uh, creating new plugin is doing that too? So A U plugin is doing that. This is A B C. You're doing. What is that? So that's the normal vector to the plane, which is the. Sorry, that's the orthogonal vector to the plane, which is the unit normal. And what is that? Oh, the vector. Yeah. Zero, negative one, zero. What do you guys think, negative guys and gals? Yes. yes, right. And we said we showed what the formula was for this. What was the normalized derivative of the unit tangent, which is just an algebraic nightmare. So I've got a nice situation here where we can just eyeball that vector, right? You can just look at it and say, oh, it's all in negative y direction. And it's a unit vector, so. Zero, negative one, zero. Good. Okay, what about the points? Points are uh, pi over two. two and zero. You want to pi, and where did you get that from? Yeah, it's the same point as last time, right? I'm at the same point on the curve. So you can use the same point for this plane. All right, so tell me the equation of the plane. Well, Yep. Yep. Tell me. Okay, so for B, you keep plugging two. Two goes here? Negative one? Keep going. And uh, y minus two. Good. And then you got zero. And then u minus two. Equals. Um, and then the, what does that simplify to? Y equals two. Y equals two. So the plane y equals two. Does that make sense with what we're looking at? Does that make sense that it would be the plane y equals 2? Because why? Why does it make sense? What's that? Yeah, why, why do we end up with y equals 2? Okay. It's parallel to the xz plane, but why? how come, how come we got y equals 2? Because the uh, Giorgio. Like the radius of the ellipse yeah. or yeah, is what? Remember? In the Y Z plane, looking down the Y Z plane, what do we have? No, the whole the whole function. We have what is this called? Ellipse. And what are the characteristics of that ellipse? Right, in the y direction, the radius is? Two. Z direction? One. Radius is always positive. Okay, so yeah, so you have a one to two ratio. So one in the z direction, two in the y direction. So that's why we're out here at y equals two, that the unit tangent to the curve at the edge of the radius in the y direction. Okay, questions on that? Okay, the la we won't, so we need to move on, but I'll just talk about the last plane is the, is the other plane, this one here. So this is called the osculating plane, osculating, and which Vector would we use to write its equation? With which vector is orthogonal to this plane? Binormal, the pink one, right? Pink one? So we got pink or purple, whatever, somewhere between. So, and how do we get the? How could we get the binormal vector? Yeah. So you could do to get to get the. I'll just. We're not going to do the whole thing, but just to get b of pi over two, you would do. T of pi over 2, cross, n of pi over 2, 
and that would give you your orthogonal vector to the osculating plane. And then what point could we have? So this would be the ABC. And then what point would we have for that plane? Same one again. It's we're because we're still at t equals pi over two, so the point still would be pi over two two zero. Boom. And with those two things, you could write the osculating plane. So the definition. So tangent and normal plane. Tangent and normal plane are kind of easier to comprehend. Right, because the we started with what? Can I have your attention, please, everybody? So the normal plane, what? Orthogonal to the curve. Yeah. The tangent plane, parallel. better than parallel. Uh, well, it's actually actually it's actually not parallel to the curve. It's it's tangent. All right. So that's the tangent, and so the osculating plane is actually more the parallel plane. It's like this, the best way I can describe it is, it's the plane that the curve is in at that moment. If you were to take just a little arc length of that curve around that point, a tiny little arc length, can I have everyone's attention? Can I have everyone's attention, please? If you were to take just a little arc length at that point, that arc length would be in a plane, right? Because it'd be like three points. The plane that that arc length is in is this plane. It's called the osculating plane. It's like the plane that the curve lives in at that moment. So if you think about a little arc length, it would be like that. And that arc length would define that plane. It's called the osculating plane. OK, let's move on. Advance the conversation. Any questions about these planes? OK, here we go. So back to my favorite vector function. This one. But now I got something new on it. <laughs> That's gold. That's gold. Oh, sorry. Just kidding. <laughs> All right. So. What about the blue vector? Do, is that familiar? Yeah. Which one is that? Someone saying velocity. Agree with that? Okay. Points in the direction of the curve and its magnitude is speed, right? Speed of the speed of how fast the curve is drawing out. So like now it's drawing, it's sweeping out very slowly. So magnitude is small on the blue one. But then when it sweeps out faster, the magnitude is Higher and it's real high at the beginning. Watch at the beginning. See how long it is? So it's coming in fast. That means for a change in your input variable t, you get lots of the curve. But now for change the same change in t, you get just a little bit of curve. So you, that is lower magnitude. And that's like speed. That's like speed. All right, so now what about this orange vector? That's the orthogonal. Is it orthogonal? So is it the, is it the unit normal? What about right now? Is the unit normal? That is now. What about the beginning? Look at the beginning. Is that the unit normal? Well, look right there. Oh, interesting thought. Okay. He's saying it's a cross product of position. But actually, sometimes it's in the same direction as the velocity. Do you see that? What's that? Is it the acceleration? No, Which yeah. direction is acceleration in? Same, same as velocity? Is it the, it's, is it the direction? All of us are trying. All right, so it's just weird, right? It's, weird. it's going, <laughs> it's just weird. It's going, it's this direction is all over the place. It's so, yeah. it's, Sometimes it's pointing in the same direction, like right now. Sometimes it's orthogonal, like right now. Sometimes it's pointing in the opposite direction, like right now. So its direction is all over the place. It's like every situation. So what the heck is this? The infinity vector. All right. 
So let's talk about acceleration. We want to make sense of this gold vector, orange, if you want. Okay, let's learn something about acceleration. So probably this is familiar. To get the acceleration, we do the second derivative, right? The derivative of the velocity of the acceleration. But to make sense of this function, there's really two things going on. So when you think of acceleration, what do you think of? You think, uh, speed up or slow down, right? You're in a car, you floor it, floor it you're accelerating, you jam on the brakes, you're deaccelerating, so it's like negative acceleration. So that's the more familiar type of acceleration. But there's another type of acceleration. Change direction. Yeah, is if you change direction, even if you're going at a constant speed, if your speed isn't changing, if you change direction, you're actually still accelerating. You're accelerating where? Towards the center of the circle. So there's two parts to acceleration. Okay, acceleration due to speeding up and slowing down, and there's acceleration due to just turning, just turning. So which direction, based on these vector functions that we've been working on, speeding up and slowing down would be in which direction would that be, given all these vector functions that we've been working on? Speeding up and slowing down would be in the direction of the velocity vector. Velocity vector, and if we just care about the direction, we call that which function? No, just the direction. Oh, just the direction. Unit, tangent. Unit tangent vector, right? So speeding up, slowing down is in the direction of capital T. Right? That's the direction we're going, right? So that's the, that's the speeding up, slowing down acceleration. What's the direction of or acceleration due to turning? In what direction does that occur? Yeah, toward the center of the curve. In what direction was that? Unit normal vector, right? Unit normal. So really, this R double prime, it has both. It's like the combination of both. When you do when you do the second derivative of, or the derivative of R prime, you get the R double prime. It has both of those together. It has both the speeding up, slowing down part, and the turning acceleration part all jumbled together. And so that's why, that's why you were seeing that orange vector going all over the place. The orange vector was indeed R double prime. But it was going all over the place because there's two things happening at once. There's speeding up, slowing down, and acceleration due to turning. So that means that that vector can point kind of in any direction. Okay. So if we, so we want to write it this way. This isn't that bad, okay? This isn't that bad. To make sense of acceleration, the second derivative, we want to write it as this is. This is acceleration due to speeding up and slowing down. So we can write that as a vector function. So without the vector, that's the magnitude of it, right? Magnitude times direction gives you that vector. So this is acceleration due to speeding up, slowing down. Accelerations sub t. And so this one here that I'm putting a, say, red box around, that's just the magnitude of it. That's just the magnitude of it. And then if you multiply it by the direction, you get it as a vector function. So does, there, does that make sense for all the symbols? Do they make sense? So same thing here. So then this is just the magnitude of acceleration due to turning. 
and that acceleration is in the normal direction, so you multiply it by n, and then all together you get That's the vector function for acceleration, only due to turning. So when you add the, the component of turning acceleration plus forward acceleration, you add them together, you get R double prime has all that together. Yeah, Max? So since uh, the second derivative. You do. But when you do the second derivative, you get that orange vector that I showed you. And it's hard to make sense of what's going on. So to make sense of that, we're going to split it into these two components, a forward component and a turning component. So now you can make sense of this is, this is acceleration due to accelerating or hitting the brakes. And this is acceleration due to turning the wheel. When you add these together, you get, you get what you would get if you take the second derivative. Make sense? Okay. So this next part, um, you, we're going to ignore this next part. I'm going to go down to the bottom. So just ignore the middle here, the stuff in the middle. Okay. Forget that. This is what I want. I'll, okay. I thought I thought you might be interested, but so do the alternatively. So alternatively, to find the tangential, here's here's how we're going to find the tangential acceleration. This should say this should say uh, at of t. Yes, this this is a function, right? So this is a function, scalar function. So a sub t of t. A sub t, the one that I wrote up here that I put the red box around. Oh, okay. So this is the scalar, okay. meaning non-vector, just the magnitude of acceleration due to speeding up or slowing down. That's either the dot product or the cross product of r prime and r double prime. So we want the part of r double prime that's in the direction of r prime or orthogonal to r prime. If we want the speeding up and slowing down. We want the part of our double prime that's in the direction of the velocity. So do we want dot product or cross product? Dot, dot, dot product. product. Good. Remember, we, that's what we learned when we learned about dot product. As much of the one, multiple, uh, the, the product and the magnitudes, as much as they're in the same direction. So we want dot products. Okay. And then the... Scalar normal acceleration. So what do we want? So this, that's not equal to the denominator. This is equal to the whole thing. I'm rewriting that. I should say a sub m t. So now we want what? We want the part of r double prime that's how compared to r prime. Direction. Orthogonal, right? We want the orthogonal part of our double prime because we want the turning part. That's orthogonal to forward direction. So we want cross, cross product, product. magnitude of the cross product. That's right. I totally disagree, Kyle. Totally disagree. I know. <laughs> Okay. Okay, so we want some numbers, sure. So that last, the corkscrew, the elliptical corkscrew function, which one do you want to find? Do you want to find the tangential acceleration of that or the normal acceleration of that? Take your pick. Okay, cut or pick tangential. So we're gonna, for that one, we're going to do this. Here we go. Okay. 
I need to make some room for myself here. All right, so can you get started? So what was our function? T, two sine T, cosine T for the corkscrew? All right, can you find, can you find a formula for the tangential acceleration for that curve, for that position function? Go. At Kyle's request. Oh, actually, there's still, it's still, it still won't be numbers. It still won't be numbers. At least it'll be a particular function, though. So let's find that tangential, tangential acceleration at pi over 2. The point that we were finding all those planes. So what's the tangential acceleration at pi over 2? Mm, I think it's easier than that. Yeah. Well, 2 sine cosine is sine of 2t. That's the only one I know that's like that. What is it telling us? At that point where we were finding the planes? What's happening? It's not moving. Is it not moving? Moving tangentially. What is it not doing? Speed is constant speed. Constant speed for a moment. Constant speed for a moment. So what about at that point? Of, at that point, would this be? Should this be zero? No. No. It's definitely turning always. Right. That thing's always turning. So this would turn out to be non-zero. But at, I think at the tops. So at the top. And at the sides, one of these is going to be always be zero. So when you reach the top and the side and the bottom, you, your speed is going to be constant for a moment. But in between, you're going to have speeding up and slowing down in between those. Tyler. Um, when you after that, do you have sine after that or cosine? Well, I had negative four cosine sine and negative and positive one cosine sine, so that makes negative three. They're like terms, right? Negative four of them, one of them makes negative three of them. Okay, any questions? 
All right, so, so maybe a good homework exercise will say like at um, like a three pi over four. A three pi over four, I'll have you guys find both normal and tangential acceleration and then interpret the results. Like in, interpret what's going on based on the numbers that you get for this function at three pi over four, okay? Uh, and that will be written down on Canvas. So let's go back to the let's go back to the orange vector. Any questions about this? Let's go back to the orange vector. Here's some snapshots along the way. So so read it like a book. So first one, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. So based on now that we know that this acceleration vector has two different parts to it, right? It has a speeding up, slowing down in the direction of motion and an acceleration due to turning. Discuss what each picture tells you about what's happening at that point. Yeah. Take your pick. Pick any one of those you want. Tell me, tell me what's going on. So, I mean, the first one, yeah, sure. the vector is kind of like, it's accelerating a little bit towards us and slowing down. So slowing down. And like turning kind of towards us. And turning towards us. Slowing down and turning towards us. What do you think? Yeah. Good. OK. Katie, how about the next one? Slowing down, turning at all? Yeah. Right now, no turning, heading in a straight line. But in all the acceleration is slowing down. Is slowing down a little bit or slowing down quite a bit? Quite a yeah, bit. right, quite a bit. Next one. Brandon. Um, the next one, it's, <coughs> it's turning in, in two degrees. Okay. And it's uh, still slowing down. Well, it's, it's I guess, yeah, it's, it's speeding. It's hard to tell in the x direction, right? Yeah. So it could be orthogonal. For sure, there's a lot of turning going on yeah. there. Maybe it's maybe it's speeding up a little bit. Okay. What about the next one? What this or Kyle? What about this one? I'd say it's probably speeding up and okay. Speeding up a little bit. And anything else? Turning. Uh, yeah. A lot or a little. Yeah, it's it's all that, that that's probably pretty close to orthogonal, yeah. and it's a it's a large magnitude, so a lot of turning, right? A lot of turning right there. Okay, Elena, what about the next one? Speeding up, slowing down, slowing down. So it's pointing kind of in the same direction as the blue vector, so that would be. So this was slowing down. Why was this slowing down? Right. Speeding up. Speeding up a lot or a little? So then this is the, the magnitude of that vector is like the magnitude of acceleration. So speeding up just a little bit. Yeah. And we're at, is it turning at all? So like this one, it says no turning at all because it's exactly in the parallel to the direction of motion. So a little bit of turning, like towards us, like a little turn and a little bit speeding up. All right, Giorgio, tell me about the last one. Um, or this one, this one, sorry. Uh, for that one, it's, it's like it's orthogonal. So yeah. A lot of turning. A lot of turning? So what would what would be the difference between a lot of turning and a little turning? What would indicate a lot of turning versus a little turning? Like this is orthogonal. Orthogonal. So yeah, if it's orthogonal. It's it's all turning. But then how would you know if it's turning a lot or a little? Oh, like the magnitude. Of right. So what would you say for this? A little. Yeah, just it's just turning a little bit, and it's not speeding up, slowing down, right? Yeah, for sure. Tyler, what about the last one? So this is in the back. It goes around and it comes around back this way. So what is it? What's happening here? Speeding up a lot or a little? Yeah, good. Right, speeding up a lot and turning just a little. So now, now we make sense of the that gold vector going all different ways and magnitudes. Yeah, David. Uh, the gold vector.
Yet, whatever component of the gold vector, so the component of the gold vector, the projection of the gold vector into the blue one, that's the, north, the tangential component of acceleration. And then the component of that gold vector in the direction of n is the, is the acceleration due to turning. So like this is all in the direction of n, this one. There's nothing in the direction of the blue, so it's not speeding up or slowing down. It's all in the direction of n, and it's just a short vector, so it's just gradually turning this way. But not speeding up or slowing down, or else it would be like this one that's turning and speeding up. Right? Because you have a component that way and a component that way. So this one's turning and speeding up. Like this one? Uh, it's pointing in the opposite direction of this, and it's a large vector. So what would that mean? Slowing down a lot. Right, so it's all the whole thing is, in, is parallel to our speed vector and it's pointing the opposite direction, so that would be slowing down a lot. Is it better? What's it? Um, yeah, so. Sometimes it's larger, sometimes it's smaller. Like here, the gold one's slightly bigger than the blue one. Here, in this case, they're the same. But it's different units, right? Because this is speed units, and this is acceleration units. So it's kind of apples to oranges in terms of the sizes of them. Does that make sense? Because they're different. Speed is like you know miles per hour, or feet per second, whereas acceleration would be like feet per second squared. So it's kind of. You know, you just want to kind of look at how these gold ones relate to each other, or how they compare to each other, not how they compare to the blue one. Okay. Granted, <coughs> you kind of can just compare it to what you're doing, like the dot product thing, and that one is going to start at its max, and it's all the way over, and then you're all the way over this way, it's negative. Right, exactly. Perpendicular right. To zero. Yeah, so if you have all turning, then the dot product is going to be zero, zero orthogonal vectors. So you're going to have you're going to have orthogonal and all uh, turning or uh, normal direction acceleration. Okay. Okay. So that's acceleration questions. Okay, so let's take this conversation elsewhere. Multivariable functions. So, so far we've been talking about vector functions. All these functions we're talking about are called vector functions. What else? What's another one we had? We just did this. How about V of t? Was that a vector function? Oh, b, right, b of t, right? b of t. What about that one I said v of t? Is that a vector function? It's called a scalar function because the values that it gives are scalars, in this case just speed. So that's a scalar function, or a real valued function, it gives a real value. All these other ones are vector functions because they give vectors, right? The, the, what, and that's what we saw in all these illustrations, okay? They give uh, something with direction and magnitude. So, multivariable function. So what about this? When we encountered uh, functions of y equals f of x, was, was that a vector function or a scalar function? Scalar. scalar. Those were scalar functions, right? We just we plotted y, the, the outputs of the function on the y-axis as real numbers. So those were, that was a scalar function. And more specifically, it was a 
single variable scalar or real value function. So single variable, um, that means one independent variable. That refers to which, x or y? Independent is x. So single variable means there's one input variable, x. And then real value function or scalar function means what comes out of the function or what the function gives is a real value. So, so these functions, y equals f of x, were single variable real valued functions. OK, what about this? Is it single variable or multivariable? Single variable. They, they want single variable still. Agree? Yeah. yeah. What's the single variable? T. 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 And is this a uh, real valued or vector valued function? Vector valued. Vector valued. So this is a single variable vector valued function. One, one independent variable. And then the function gives out vectors, right? And, and our application of this was position, right? Position vectors. So what would be a multivariable real valued function? What would that be like? Colin? Of, of x and y. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So you, you have more than one independent variable, like you said, f of x and y. And what might that equal then? So then you're going to, and what's that going to give you? A, a vector? Or a scalar? Uh, if it's real valued. No, not if it's real valued. If it's real valued, that determines what, what you're going to get. So you're going to get a vector, you're going to get a scalar, right? You're going to get a scalar. So the example here is z is f of xy. z is a function of x and y. So we've been talking about vector functions for a while now. We've got those under our belt. And now we're going to start talking about these kinds of functions which are called multivariable real valued functions. More than one input variable, but not a vector that comes out, just a real number. OK, here's a good application of that. This is a nice basic one. That wave heights in the ocean are a function of two different variables working together. What the wind speed is, and then how long that wind speed is blowing for. OK? So. I should have taken a video, but I'm sure I could find one like it. When I was, we were at Rocky Point a couple years ago, and it was 4 p.m. in the afternoon, and I walked down, and the waves were like twice as tall as me, and I, I still tried to go in and, and swim and get through the waves, and I almost killed myself. Are you not trying to the rocks? What's that? How are you not trying to the rocks? There, there wasn't rocks. It was just, it was just the beach. But the waves were like 15 feet high. Okay, why were they so tall? Why were the waves so high? It's windy. Was it windy just for a little while? Just did the wind just start picking up for a long time, right? So the, the way that this value, this real value, gets high is if you have a high value of speed, wind speed, and a long value of time. Both of those together then will give you big waves. But if you have a high value of wind speed for just a little bit of time, you're not going to get big waves, right? It'll, just, it'll affect the water, ripple the water a little bit. And then if you have a low wind speed, just a gentle breeze for a long period of time, same, same thing, thing, small yeah. waves, right? Mm -hmm. So it depends on both. That's the whole point, that the wave height in the ocean depends on both. And so that's the, an example of, of a multivariable real valued function. The multivariable, multivariables being wind speed and duration of time, and then the real value being wave height. OK, so there's. Four representations of these. How do we represent these multivariable functions? So the first is, like what I just gave you, that wind height. I want that. I want this. So the first one is like an equation or a function. So if z equals x squared plus y squared, then we could also say f of x, y equals x squared plus y squared. So that's called a function definition. The function definition tells you how you get the real values given the values of the variables, right? So if x is 1 and five is, or y is 5, then this function tells you how you get the real value, which is, what would it be if x is 1 and y is 5? 26. Then your real value would be 26 when x is 1 and y is 25.
So that's that's the first way. Okay. Next would be a graph. And we know how this graphs. We've seen this before. What is that equation? Z equals x squared plus y squared. We've seen this before. The cylinder? The circle? Nope. Good. Okay, so it's not a cylinder because we have all three variables. And we spent 15 minutes in class on this. Remember working this one up? You remember what it was? Paraboloid. What's that? Paraboloid. Paraboloid. It's a paraboloid. Remember that? We we found the traces. Remember we, we found we set x equal to some values and we found some traces. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And then so this is our reference paraboloid. What's the vertex? Which way does it open? Is it elliptical or circular? Circular, opens upwards, vertex is at? There's zero. Best paraboloid I've drawn all day. So that's the second. So this graph, surface, right? So these functions are going to be equations of x, y, and z. So it's going to be z equals something with x's and y's. And we know that the equations of x, y, and z give us surfaces. Remember that? So, so we're going to get surfaces. All right. So the last one is a table of values. So this is pretty self-explanatory, so I can just say like z, x is negative 1, 0, 1, 2, 1, 2, 3, and then then the values in the table would be the values of the So like when y is 1 and x is negative 1, what's the value of our function? 2. 2. And when you have 2 and 1, 5, 0 and 3. So this table is another way to represent that function because it's giving you what values of the, the real values of the dependent variable for any combination of values that are in them. We'll start out with uh, 3 on Tuesday next week. <laughs>